<laughs> All right, Matias, we are here on the eve of the biggest NSL regular season match of the season, the final regular season match of the NSL season. We're two weeks away from the NSL finals, and tomorrow night, 6 p.m., streaming live on the NSL YouTube channel, we will see a contest between your New York City Knights and the Newport Dragons. The winner of that matchup wins the North Division, hence booking their spot in the NSL finals coming up in a couple weeks here in Philadelphia at the Spectre Center, which is uh, you know, kind of your stopping grounds right now. Obviously, you went to Drexel and you graduated and you're, you're based part-time in Philly as well. So what would it mean to you to have a chance to play in the NSL finals after a huge win a couple weeks ago against Chicago for New York? You guys are uh, on the cusp of, uh, of making history, being, being the first uh, North Division champions in NSL history. No, it would be it would be completely amazing. Like obviously playing in front of my friends and playing in front of my crowd, like just having, like being able to play this match like at home. You know, Philadelphia feels like home for me. I spent a lot a lot of time of my life there, so it would it would be a dream. But obviously we have a, we have a big matchup against the Dragons that we have to win before even thinking about the finals. So right now we're just focused on on Saturday. Yeah, and we'll talk about the Dragons matchup later on. But I want to ask you about that Chicago match that we mentioned earlier. You were the man of the match. You had a record six points on your second power play, which I actually misspoke on the broadcast. I counted five on the broadcast upon looking back. You had six points in that two-minute power play, which is the most in the history of the NSL. You broke the record. You won man of the match. Take me through that performance and what allowed you to play at such a high level there because obviously you're not the highest-ranked player in the NSL. During the NSL draft, you were taken, I believe, ninth overall. and yet ninth or tenth, you were, you were taken in the middle part of that second round despite not at the time even being ranked in the top 100. But we knew how dangerous you were gonna be on the power play and how good you were at attacking and how much potential you had. So kind of take me through everything that led to that performance and you being ultimately the best guy on the court on that given day in Chicago. Well, I feel like it was a combination of things. I feel like the trust our owner had in me gave me a lot of confidence. You know, Elizabeth drafting me at number 10 without being in the top 100, just because we played like earlier in the morning and she saw me in the exhibition and like she liked what she saw in my game. That also like that really gives me a lot of like confidence in, in my own game, like knowing that someone would take me without like metrics behind it, you know, just of pure like talent and skill seen on court. And then on top of that, like having the team we had was like I mean our team is just unbelievable. Having Sebastian who is a great leader, you know, it's one of those guys that just getting one point of him is it's impossible. Like he gets everything back, hits everything tight, like no wonder why he's ranked so high. Yeah. And also at the time in Chicago, having Sam, like I feel like Sam is Sam doesn't get enough credit for how good he is as a player. Yep. Like a lot of people know him in the U.S. because he was like an astonishing junior. But I think like a lot of people on tour don't know who he is, and like again, don't give him enough credit. Like I can guarantee you, Sam trained for three, four months, and he would be in the top hundred, like level wise at yeah. least. If you just get some fitness, some like match yep. play back. Sam is an incredible player. So like I, I really feel blessed of the <laughs> like, of the team we got. And obviously now that we have Rory, another top 40 ranked player, it's like, it's a, it's a dream of a team that it only like pumps confidence into, into the players, right? Because like knowing that you, your teammates have your back just makes everything better. Yeah, and it's well balanced, like you kind of said, where Sebastian is kind of a minutes eater, can go out there, can extend rallies, unbelievable athlete, unbelievable mover, unbelievable fitness. And Sam's obviously one of the great college players of the last decade. You know that all too well. You guys overlapped in your time playing you know, at Drexel and you know him playing at Harvard. I don't know if you guys would have lined up because he was usually playing a bit further down the lineup just because that Harvard team was so strong, but such a fit individual. And then you bring in your attacking prowess and your powerful, explosive game. You're kind of a bit of a firecracker up there. It's like it's really fun to watch um, the contrast of styles, and that's what you need. to be, you know, that's, that's the way you're supposed to build a team in the NSL. That's why you guys were so successful in that first match and why there's a good chance you guys will uh, find a lot of success uh, tomorrow against the Dragons. Before we do preview that matchup, probably at the end of this conversation, I want to talk about you as a player, because I think something that the NSL is all about is promoting a lot of these personalities in the game that don't necessarily get the attention of a lot of squash fans or squash media, where we focus a lot on the guys in the top 10, the guys that are consistently playing the platinum events, but I do think that we owe it to the fans and owe it to the players to talk about the guys that are up and coming. Obviously, you're 24, you're a recent graduate you know, of college, and you had this incredible collegiate career, your first team All-American your senior year, and you, you did all these you know, crazy, amazing things. I know you're undefeated junior year, and you got hurt, and, and the, you had this great college career, but a lot of people don't know who you are. Now you're just kind of getting into the top 100. You're making some noise with your trick shots, and I think, you know, I thought, well, coming to New York, who better to sit down with than uh, Mr. Newton, who's been an absolute pleasure to work with so far 
while we've been kind of going back and forth doing all this NSL stuff. So I figured let's let's chat with Matias and do a little bit of a spotlight on him as a player and allow the NSL fans and pro squash fans to get to know you. So I want to start by going back to the junior days. You are a pretty successful junior. I know you're playing a lot of different international tournaments, U11, U13. What went into your love for squash? Because I know in addition to being one of the fastest rising stars on the Pro Tour, you're one of the biggest fans of squash on the Pro Tour, uh, as has been well documented, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But take me through, like, how did you start playing, and how did you kind of fall in love with squash at first? I um, mean, first of all, thanks out for all the compliments. <laughs> it means a lot. And, yeah, like, I wasn't, I wasn't always a great junior. I, I started strong just because I was so in love with the game when I was young. I used to compete in... In everything I, I used to train tennis I competed in soccer I competed in volleyball I competed in squash to a point where my parents came to me and they were like like dude we can't take you to four practices a day you have to pick something and then they started like narrowing it down I started doing better in squash I started competing like internationally when I went to uh, South American junior games when I was like nine years old or like eight <laughs> something like that so obviously like as time passed they started committing more to squash and I ended up just playing squash and soccer and then when I started doing better U13s start of U15s then I decided to take a step down with uh, with soccer just because I wanted to commit to something and be great at one thing which was tough at the moment because I I love soccer almost as much as I love squash not just enough but <laughs> But yeah, and so I think that love that I always had for the sport just led me to be good in juniors because it's all about the passion when you're that young. Obviously, there's a lot of technical aspects that I probably missed because I'm pretty sure I missed my first uh, couple of backhand lessons. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I think it's more about the passion. And yeah, I struggled a little bit in juniors as soon as I hit U15s and 17s because I always was, uh, I was very uh, like small for my age. Like I was tall. I've seen some of the old pictures. Yeah, you're you're you're. I, I was a, I was a little kid for a long yeah. time. You know, like I when I was young, U 11s, U 13s. It was I was tall. It was like pretty average. But as people started hitting that growth spurt, I just kept going. You know, so I I never like grew until I was like late 17s. So U 15s and 17s was a nightmare for me. Like I would lose a lot of matches. I would go to I think I'm pretty sure I, I lost like second round of U S Open. Uh, just struggled a lot with motivation and like just truly believing that I, I wanted to do it and then Martin Knight came to Colombia uh, Martin used to be a, a top 35 player um, I think from New Zealand he took over the coaching role in, for the Colombian national team and he completely helped me to change my game and take that step that made me become way better at squash when I was 17 18 which is where I got top 16 in the world juniors and I started making like deep runs in tournaments I won the Canadian yeah. junior open so yeah he, with his help, I kind of was able to like take that step to the next level, which led me eventually to go to college. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, and I think it'll be interesting to talk about now that we are, is that you're still this kind of like lanky, skinny guy. You don't have the big barrel chest like a lot of guys that come from Colombia, like a Miguel Rodriguez, like even a Juanca Vargas or, or some of those guys. You are pretty slender, and obviously you're training a good bit here. Do you think that growing up in a place like Colombia where there's all that altitude, does that give you kind of that inherent advantage when it comes to the fitness aspect where you're at all that altitude and then you come to the States and you're like, oh, I feel like my, my lungs are just full of air, I can run forever? Or is it not necessarily um, as, as big of a deal as maybe some people I think it I think it definitely gives you an advantage for the first, like, say, couple of weeks. Like, if you come from altitude to do, like, play a, a tournament in the States, you will feel like you're you can go forever like your lungs just can take anything but i'm not sure if that's something genetic that we get from being from there because every time i go back home i struggle a lot as well there's three four days where you can't really play the squash you want to because like you can't breathe and also i think a pretty big disadvantage that a lot of people don't take into consideration is that squash changes a little bit as well we play with a green dot this the, the game is much faster volleying is much harder uh, hitting a good drop is much harder as well because the ball doesn't sit in and the game becomes more of like hitting it really hard and trying to outpace your opponent which makes sense to a decent like to an extent with Miguel because like if you see Miguel's game he loves going to the back of the court he loves like extending the rallies and everything because that's where he grew up and where he like learned how to play squash at that big like high level but I don't think it's something genetic I think it's always something that you have to keep in mind and like work on like depending on where you yeah. are it's not a poof. It's, it's something you have to be conscious of exactly. all the time. 
So then we move through your junior career. You told me actually that you one year, very early on, you beat Andrew Douglas in the second round of the U.S. Junior Open. You beat Spencer Lovejoy in the first round. Mm-hmm. So you have a history with these guys that have now been a huge part of the NSL, but are also two guys that have been icons within college squash over the last decade. Two, two, I mean, two guys that played number one all four years for their respective schools at, at, at two Ivy League programs and two of the top teams in the country, and you know, two guys that you became good friends with. So you come to the States to play college squash. This is something that perhaps you're following in the footsteps of fellow Colombian Juan Camilo Vargas, who comes to the States to play squash. He goes to Trinity. He played number one there for his freshman year and had an incredible season and helped Trinity to win the national championship on many occasions. You initially committed to Trinity, as you've told me in the past. What happened? Why didn't you end up there with Coach Paul Asiante? And then how did you end up at Drexel with John White? And how do you help Drexel ultimately to a number five overall finish in the country, which is you know their best finish in program history? So I've, I've always been a big believer that everything happens for a reason. You know, It's something I've always had in the back of my mind and it just helps me cope with life. <laughs> and I, this is one of the things that like makes me believe it the most, you know? Like I was verbally committed to Trinity for like a long time. I got gear sent to me, like everything was like ready, you know? Cause Juan Camilo was there, Catalina was there, Juan Diego Lopez was there, like just a bunch of Colombian players that went there. Everything kind of worked out. And then just like, I, I never really like thought about applying anywhere else. Cause I just thought it was, it was gonna be fine. You know, like I thought it, that's what was gonna be. And then I think it was like October, November, year before I, I started my college career. And for some reason, I am not accepted in Trinity College. Uh, not really sure, but everything happens for a reason, you know. And then I went through a couple of tough months because I was late to applying for uh, for university. Like I was right. late You're to apply. Able now. You didn't like, you you hadn't <coughs> even considered any exactly. Other I, I didn't even consider starting any other process. Was it? I, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Was it like an academic thing, or what did did uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that Paul wanted you there. It was. In terms I, of your I'm, level. I'm not sure, you know. And I think again, I feel like it happened for a reason, you know. It was never extremely clear, but it's not like I have like hard feelings or anything. I just feel like right. it wasn't possible at the time for whatever reason. And they also got a really good class the same year, so it, like it made yeah. sense, you know. Like I think they had a really good um, Egyptian guy, Ali Tolba, same year, yeah. who was also a top junior and everything. So it's not like you know they also have good players going. Right. And then after that, I was a little bit lost. I, I was like freaking out with my family. I'm like, oh, what do we do now? Like, I don't want to study in Colombia. I don't want to stop playing squash. But, like studying in Colombia pretty much means that squash is not going to go 100%, you know? It's right. difficult. Do, do, they have squa- do they have squash teams at university in Colombia or yeah, not? Yeah, they but, do, but it's just not even close to the same level. Not even, com- like, not okay. even comparable. Yeah, like, it. it's more like a recreational league. Got so it. it's like... Uh, Again, like I, I start freaking out a little bit. I start doing what I can, and that's when I met like people in my life that just like I, I believe like they mentored me to where I wanted to be, and I like appreciate like deeply people like Gilly Lane. I had a conversation with Gilly when it was very late about the application process and everything, and he was like the most genuine and like kind-hearted guy at the time. That like, just pretty much told me everything was gonna be fine, and like just brought back that confidence in my game and in my purpose to go to the States. Yeah. He was like, listen, like, I, it's going to be difficult with Penn. Obviously, my grades weren't fantastic. It was very late in the application process. I don't, like, yeah, like, I wasn't getting into Penn at the time. Right. But he was like, yeah, I want you to, like, pursue it. And I want you to come to the States regardless of where you go because he really believed in me as, like, a person. And I, I really appreciated that. And I always, always thought, like, that led me to go wherever I wanted. Yeah. And then another person I talked for a little bit was Mike Way in Harvard as well. Also, like, deeply appreciate him. He told me that the best option was probably to do, like, a year in the States as a high school. Like, as as a high schooler, repeat one year, then use those grades to go in. So a lot of people, like, kind of guided me towards going to the States regardless of where, you know, which I really appreciated and it really, like, confirmed my belief that, like, the best place for me to go was was the, the States. And I was very lucky to meet yeah those people at the time and then i went to play canadian junior open everything again happened for a reason i uh, sprung my ankle the day before the canadian and i was about to pull out because i was uh, i had i had to play the us open you know it was my last one and then i don't know just took some painkillers like 
went through it one first round, one second round, ankles started getting better, I ended up winning the Canadian Junior Open. And then when I went to this, uh, the US Open, I was playing against Cole Becker. I believe it was round of 16, I think so. And I remember like going on court with him. I knew who he was because he was a top ranked uh, American at the time in, in the age group. And I see that John and Theo Woodward sit outside my court and I'm like, freaking out because you know, you're like, a super fan you're like oh my god that's john white exactly I was probably like, half the guys there don't know who exactly i was like damn that's john white yeah match went my way i won 16 14 in the fifth wow to advance to quarterfinals i come out of the court and john comes to me and he's like hey my name is john white and over the inside i was like i, I know who you are <laughs> and then after he was like we would like to like ex- like explore the possibilities of you coming to drugs university and i was like sign me yeah. <laughs> like i'll go you know obviously we went through the whole process it wasn't like that but it, it worked out and it ended up working out. Again, I think everything happens for a reason, you know? Yeah. Like, I ended up in the place I love with the people I love the most, with a coach that guided me to the level I am right now. Yeah. In so, own way, so what, what is uh, John White like as a coach? What, how, what, what was your experience like with him over your four years? He's the most understanding guy in the world. Like, he manages to give you the best advice or the best coaching in ways that you don't even understand. You know, it's like he is not one to come and give you a full speech or tell you that your back end is marginally better doing something different. He works with you and understands your personality to a different level, which enhances you to perform at the level you want. And what I was telling you before the interview as well, like stuff like me having the coffee before the matches. He knew I hated having breakfast before my matches. He knew I hated waking up at 8 a.m. for team breakfast so I could go there and sit and not eat anything. And he, he always saw that I was doing the best for myself and for the team. So it was never like selfish. It was just more about like, getting that win for the team. Yeah. So he always worked with me, saying like, hey, listen, if you don't want to do this and it's better for you to like, sleep one more hour and go get your coffee, do it. Just come before the match. Just show up at this time. So he always worked with me instead of against me in, the, in those kind of senses, which right. is what I feel a lot of coaches don't do and ended up clashing a lot with their players and not enhancing their, their, their power. And then throughout my entire career, Drexel, John was like that. John always, like, he saw me struggling with school or something, or he saw me struggling with squash because I didn't like it at the time, or it's like, take a week off. Don't do this. Don't do that. Or do this, you know? And I always listened to him most of the time. He was probably angry listening to this, but I listened to him to, <laughs> to an extent. And it always worked out really well because obviously I, I admire him a lot and I, I want to be like him. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like just the combination between my personality and him as a coach worked out perfect and that's what like helped lead the team to to that great finish because he was like that not only with me but with all the players you know so is he obviously for those who don't know is really one of the greatest players of all times a former world number one world champion and all of this but is he um he's a world champion right or am i am i i think he lost the final I think you're. I think you're right. I caught myself there because because I can't get anything past you. This is this is the one guy where I, I know like because I saw you kind of perk up in your chair. I know he's former world number one. That that is no. Yeah, he was the world number one yes. for sure. But I'm I'm not sure it's a sensitive topic because I think he lost to Palmer in the final of the world championships. And Palmer got a couple. So yeah. Palmer Palmer could have given John one. Like, he could have <laughs> just been like, here you go. But but you said that he doesn't really. You know, he's kind of very understanding. He's very helpful in certain ways, and he's understanding of the different personalities, which, which is very important in terms of a coach managing a locker room. Everyone needs to be coached differently. Everyone has – some guys maybe need to be yelled at a little bit. Some guys need to be spoken to in a certain way. Whatever gets everyone on the right page and fired up. And you, you kind of got to you know, go on a case-by-case basis. You can't choose what's best for the whole team. That being said, I'm sure he has some sort of technical slash tactical slash mental – expertise that he has to offer you how did he get, kind of go about that uh in terms of and, and are you kind of picking his brain when it comes to those sorts of things yeah it's, it's really funny because he has a very unique way of like expressing his his thoughts and i feel like mm, it's not for everyone you know not everyone can work in this in that way but i do a hundred percent so with me it always everything he said even if for some people it didn't make sense at all it would make sense for me like i had a couple times that, that my favorite one of all I probably can't say it here, but you'll understand it. I come out, I was playing against Marwan. I was a game down. Marwan Tarek? Yeah, Marwan Tarek. And Drexel. Yeah. So it was a big match, everything, like, obviously, like, Marwan, we all know how good Marwan is. Yeah. 
and then I come out, I was very tense, I was very like, you know, like I wasn't playing my squash, I was like just focusing more on who I was playing rather than playing my game. And then I was trying to like find answers, to find ways to like go about it. And he just looks at me and just like shakes his head. And he says like, just hit the bad word front wall. <laughs> you know, like you're not hitting the front wall. Go like, you know? And he, he meant that I wasn't doing like, that I wasn't playing my game, you know? I was leaving everything short. I was leaving like, I wasn't flowing. I was tense. He was like, you're literally not playing how you should play. And at the time it just made so much sense. And like stuff like that, time and time and time again, it like happened. And I really don't understand how, but it worked, you know? There was another time I was playing James Wyatt. I was um, one game up. I come back, I had a ridiculous blister at the time. So I was struggling with it. I come out of the first game and he didn't really like how, we, how I played. So it was a little sloppy. I think I was like 10-7 down and I won 12-10. But it wasn't like, fantastic. I come out and I take like 10 or 15 more seconds than I'm supposed to, coming back in court. Because obviously I took my shoe off, I like taped my blister, just took some extra time. I walk in court and John tells the referee to give Wyatt a point because of because I used too much time. Wow. Yeah. And I look at him and I'm like, like, what are you doing? Like, I, I got so pissed. I'm like, what are you doing? I took like 15 more seconds. Like, you're my coach. What are you doing? He's like, literally just does like this. And I go into that game and I win it like 11-2. <laughs> just got me so rallied. Like, I don't know if he helped me like wake up or what, what did he do? But I literally come out of that next game and the only thing I'm thinking about is like, why did you do that? I come out of that game, I won 11-2, I was 2-0 up, and they're like, like, why did you do that? Like, what was the purpose? They're like, just go play. And I ended up winning in three, you know? And it, it <laughs> you know, stuff like that. that That's like, unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. And and it's, just the, it's just the unspoken understanding when you when and that's that that must be satisfying for him to find a player that's on the same wavelength too as as he is and, and probably pretty rewarding and you know i'm sure for for you to you know say these things i'm sure he he understands that you feel this way or you've expressed it to him in some way that's rewarding as a coach to be able to you know talk to a player like that and i think i i am critical sometimes of people not that i don't do i'm i'm very entrenched in the college squash world right now playing and i just finished up my freshman year and I, I, I catch myself doing it too, which I know it's a horrible idea, but the coaching for 90 straight seconds in between games or the pro level for two straight minutes in between games, it's never necessary. One or two things, 30 seconds, let the person come off, catch their breath, talk to them, give them a couple things, work on this, do this differently, and then go away. Let them, let them collect their thoughts, internalize what you just said for 30 seconds, and then they go back on court. It's generally the rule of thumb, I think. So it sounds like he's very simplistic in what he says. Um, I had a very cool opportunity too at the individual competition. You mentioned Gilly, obviously. I've had the opportunity to do uh, the opportunity to do the college squash podcast, Squash University, a little shameless plug that, that I'm doing with him this year. So I've gotten to know him a little bit, and I went to individuals, and he said, "Jackson, come here. Like, why don't you watch Abdul Rahman Dweek, who plays number five for Penn, was playing in one of the side draws. He wasn't in the main top yeah. draw for the individuals, but he's like, come watch. We're gonna we're gonna coach the match." So it was Gilly, it was Sue Crawford, and it was Jack White. And they're all sitting there in a row, and then there's me. And I'm just watching them talk about the match. And they have a million thoughts. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? And then Dewey comes off. That's literally, like, yeah, I, I don't remember who it was that chatted with him. I think one game it was Stuart, one game it was Gilly. I think they mixed yeah. it up. One or two things, very quick. Most of the stuff that they're all, like, chatting about, it was unbelievable hearing, like, the analysis and how next level it is. But then they, they're, it's, they're very simple when they're talking to Dweek himself because they don't want to overload him with yeah. all this information. I think that's something that's, that's so interesting that you kind of hit on there. With, yeah, I feel uh, like with, for, with for every player is different. You know, every player has yeah. their ways. And the most important thing is finding a coach that understands you and understands how you work to enhance your level. That's why I'm so grateful of like John and what I think like everything led me to drugs for a reason, you know, like I I know it can be very difficult with a lot of my ways, you know, like the not having breakfast, the like waking up late before the match, like just stuff like I like doing, you know, like f from like dumb things like wearing flip flops constantly. Like I always got in arguments with my uh, <laughs> with Martin in Colombia because I would wear flip flops everywhere and like he didn't like it. It's just like stuff like that that I just like doing my way for some reason, you know, yeah. And it goes to an extent because I know sometimes it can just be dumb and I can fix it. But some other times it's just like who I am. I can't stay. I had a lot of talks with, uh, with Martin. 
about that because in all the South American tournaments, Pan Ams and everything, what you should do is you go play your match, go back to the hotel, rest. That would drive me crazy. Like I, I for some reason don't work like that. I'd rather stay at the venue, chat with people, like talk to people that I haven't seen in a the long time. The environment, exactly. And just be that, comfortable, exactly. hang out. Yeah. That makes my game of squash like thrive more than just staying in a hotel. And at the beginning, it was a little tough because obviously his way was the more traditional way. And we got to a point where we would understand each other to uh, to an extent that it was very similar than with John. Like there was times where he knows I go to bed like relatively early, uh, relatively late before matches just because the anxiety, like, you know, you're so excited to play, it's tough to sleep. There's a couple of tournaments I remember messaging him at like 1 a.m. because I know he's the same as me. And I'm like at 1 a.m. like, hey, you want to go downstairs and have a, like a Coke or like a Sprite or something like that and just talk a little bit? Yeah, sure. And we'd go down the hotel 1 a.m. just to have a chat, a 30 minute chat and go to bed, you know? Stuff like that is, I think, what makes a coach like great is like just understanding those type of things from player to player. And most of the times that I had experiences like that, I ended up winning the day after and having like one of the best tournaments of my life. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm really thankful for having them like in my life. And I think that's what like all about being a good yeah, coach is. That's you know? amazing. And, and I do, I do want to make a, a correction. I don't know if I said Gilly Stewart and John White, I think I said, I, I meant Jack Wine, who's obviously the women's coach of Penn yeah. and Hobbs as the, as the assistant that was what I meant to say. But, yeah. so I would say the same initials, obviously. But are you still working with John, is my next question. Because obviously you're still in Philly, you're working with Martin when you're back in Columbia, I assume, and you, you obviously have a couple, you know, great trading partner, Bogatel with Miguel. Yeah. But then, when you're in Philly, is it mainly with Whitey? Are you working with, I, I know you do some stuff at the Spectre Center. Do you, have you worked with Bang He at all? Like, like what, who are you mainly kind of training with so when you're in Philly? So right now is a great question. Because like, <laughs> I've, I've always like, I feel like everyone has something to, something to offer in their own game, right? Yeah. Like everyone, that's why so many of the pro players go from coach to coach. It's just to yeah. see greatness and like displayed in different ways. Yeah. If you go talk to John White, you go talk to Rami Ashur, you go talk to Shabana, all of them are gonna have that world number one perspective in their own aspect of the game, which is what makes yeah. great players even greater, you know? Yeah. So, my, I, it's not like I have like a main coach, but I work with people, you know? Dylan Cunningham is actually the one I work the most with. Yeah, who's, who's, who's the, the, the coach assistant for Drexel, yeah, right? assistant coach yeah. of Drexel. I work with him like very closely on like tournament selection, on stuff that I could work on in squash, on like just technical stuff that like day-to-day -day yeah. stuff, you know? I work with John a lot when I'm in Philly for more like like game tactical aspects because obviously you see him hit a ball and you're like how do you do that you know and I am a player that at this point I can hit a good ball as well <laughs> but you, you hit with him and it's just a completely different thing so yeah. having like the chances to hop on court with him and just see how he sees the game of squash obviously changes my entire perspective and like gives me like a big boost yeah. so when I'm in Philly I work with him in the Spectre Center, I, uh, I've worked with Benghi a couple of times, but never too closely. I was more of like a, like a training partner, you know, I would go yeah. play with Timmy, with Spencer, with Dylan Huang, like whoever was there, because it was great sessions and I would join. But I never really worked one-on-one -on -one with Benghi. I would work way more with Karim. And Karim yeah. is someone that, Karim Ibrahim, like Yusuf's brother, for yeah. whoever doesn't know him. I, I appreciate him a lot and he's one of the like best people in, on tour I and know, he's like, newer there too isn't he is yeah he, he started I think he started there uh, two years ago maybe yeah. and then he worked his, himself up to being like the main coach yeah but he's he's a very like he means well you know like he wants people to do better just for the fact for the sake of being better yeah and like I really he appreciate cares. him yeah. exactly he cares about the game of squash and about making the game better and like I I appreciate him a lot because he has helped me so much in squash with just a couple of tips. Uh, we've had a couple of sessions where we literally work on what I'm really bad at. <laughs> and he tells me like straight to my face, like, you are really bad at this. You have to work with it. Yeah. Like, I can help you. We can have a session. I'm like, let's do it. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm all open to improve. So yeah. I work with him a lot and he has helped me for, we've had like a handful of sessions and he's helped me more than 95% of people <laughs> I've worked with. So it's, yeah, I, I appreciate him a lot. Yeah. And then lastly, obviously, Martin, when I'm at home, right. I don't talk to him on a daily basis or anything because obviously he's very busy with being the national coach. I'm busy being between Philly and Colombia, like working, like do all with the NSL, all that stuff. So it's not like we can have a consistent training program, but we know each other extremely well, as I mentioned. And every time I go to a tournament or I get selected for something, 
and we have like a training camp before it all it's always the same you know it's always like he helps me improve my game in aspects every single time i train with him every time i go back and just pick up where we left off and i feel like he's always helped me a lot and he will always help me a lot because he knows me more than pretty much everyone <laughs> in the squid squash yeah it's interesting what you say about getting the different perspectives that's like Mohamed El Shabag is a guy that's been to a million different coaches. Now he's in Prague with uh, Gregory Gaultier. And it's not necessarily that he has all these maybe toxic coaches or he's difficult to work with or he always has to move on, but it's like eventually I'd imagine if you work with a coach for more than a few years, you kind of get maybe a little complacent with one another. Maybe the co your coach stops noticing new things and new, new, new innovative ways to help your game because you know, you've just seen you play so many times. It's good to get, from the player standpoint, different fresh eyes on your game and different fresh perspectives and, and new kind of ideas. That's like, I mean, Paul Cole's a guy that is the world number two right now and has really two different coaches. He sees Rob Bowen sometimes, he sees Rodney Martin sometimes. He kind of goes back and forth. So I think that is a really interesting approach that the majority of guys on the pro tour don't necessarily do, but it is a strategy that has worked at a, at, a, at, you know, at a very high level before. Yeah, no, I feel like, yeah, like, I mean, with people like Sherbag, it's just like inspirational, you know, because he's achieved everything. He's one of the goats in squash. Like, I don't understand how he's not like put up there with like Jahang here and everything for being greatest of all time because he is, yeah. you know, like, he's won it all. He's been in all tournaments, he's won every tournament. The longevity and how young he was. Exactly, so he was and, from yeah. he was 19, 20 years old to right now. He's won like he's still performing at the highest of levels, yeah. and I think that the, only, the one world championship hurts him. You'd like him to have maybe three or four. Yeah, that's the one thing. Of but course, other than of that, course. His, his resume is like unbelievable. Exactly, but it's still I mean, yeah, the longevity and the, the level that he is able to produce when he gets in the zone, and you see him and like you think like what what is he looking for? He's always one like looking to improve more. You know, even at having the career he had or he has, I guess, yeah. and he's still looking for ways to improve. It just, it just, like tremendously inspirational. You know, because yeah. if you see a guy that good, look for help in so many different places. Imagine someone that is just starting their career like me. Like it's just endless possibilities, right? right. So I feel like limiting, limit, like yeah, limiting yourself to like one approach from a coach. It can't be great, you know. I feel like you have to have different perspective and take what yeah. people like the best out of what people can can give you, you know? yeah. and always shape that into your own game. Because yeah. I know if I work with um, Rob Owen, he's probably gonna have a heart attack if he sees my backhand. <laughs> yeah, I was I was gonna say. <laughs> I just talked to Simon Simon Herbert a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and he's totally like he he was much like you, and you can already see he's a lot more intentional. There, like he's got the classic. They all have the same thing. Paul Cole and Simon and Joe Bryan, even when he played yeah. in this past week, they all have the same exact swing on the backhand, and it works. But he's kind of a my way or the highway type of guy, and maybe that I don't know if that one. Gel yeah, but I feel like I, mean, I feel like it's but you can great. still learn from it. Exactly, yeah. obviously. Like, but it's more like yeah, because you never want to be like play someone else's game. You always want to play. I, a big thing I have in my mind is I, I always want to play my game. You know, I I want to create my own brand of game and my own squash. That's why I want to do the trick shots. That what I have the fun shots. That it's always I want it to be my game. Yeah. But obviously, you have to improve and get better and better and better with the help of people that have already been there. You know. Yeah. So if I go and train with Robo and go to the first four days getting yelled at because my backhand's horrible, <laughs> but then just getting something out of it, you know, I think it would be great, you know? Yeah. And it's also great because he, he, I mean, if he sees that it works for me, he might also see like them, like that can actually work. And he might find, I don't know, a different thing to like see different on court, you know? Exactly. So I feel like coaching, yeah. always seeing different aspects of the game and analyzing the game in different ways can only improve your game, yeah. you know? So. Yeah. And so you mentioned the trick shots. Another way that you're very similar to your coach at Drexel, John White, who's one of the great exhibition players of all time, yeah. John White is, is you also play with a lot of flair, and you've built up this brand on social media of the trick shot guy. You just showed me your newest one that you did here. You've had some unbelievable ones this season, but I mean, you've been, you've been doing it forever. This way. But really, this season, I feel like it's, it's caught in wind, and, and people are starting to figure out like who is Matthias Knudsen. And it's been a huge year for you. Obviously, on the Pro Tour, you've broken into, into the top 100 as well. And, you know, it's been a great year for you, but a lot of it has to do with, uh, with the trick shots. Where does that come from? Like, when did you start doing that? Have you always just been kind of, like, since junior days, like, you've always been messing around with it? You, you figured, like, why not capitalize on this and start posting things? Yeah, I feel like it was a combination between finishing school, having a little bit more time, you know, because I finished the master's at Drexel. I, I studied five years at Drexel. So there was obviously like not that much free time yeah. around for that kind of stuff. Right. 
But now that I'm committed to the Pro Tour, I wanted to use that like business approach I, I learned, which is my other passion, like finance and business and all that stuff. I wanted to kind of put that into my life and bring in a, a different approach that would create a brand around myself that's not solely based on results, you know? And the more I like studied about like just what sports mean and how everything works, the more I understood that like, not everyone's looking to see a winner. Like a lot of people want a show rather than a competition, you know, in sports. Yeah. In baseball, people go to see the home runs. They don't really care if someone wins like a regular season game, you know? And I feel like obviously people are more likely to tune in if they see an insane goal in soccer or a 60 yard touchdown or some, stuff like that, you know? So I feel like I wanted to get an edge and like something, bring a different edge, like, yeah, edge to the game, which is something no one has ever done before. Yeah. And I thought about it at the beginning and I wanted to do like every sport, you know? I wanted to have tricks in you know, every sport and have like that kind of like approach on social media. But it's obviously tough to find a consistent following if you have like the algorithm in every sport and whatever. You can do a really yeah. tough trick and not get any views. Or you can do something really simple and get all the views. Just because it always, like, what matters is getting the right people to look at your videos. You know? right. So I started doing some golf tricks, some soccer tricks, and they were cool and everything, but they weren't quite, like, biting as much as I wanted, because I wasn't getting to my target audience. And as soon as I started focusing solely on squash, it started to grow exponentially, and people started yeah. liking it, a lot of people got involved. I got a lot of people, like, people like Nick Matthew commenting on my videos, Rami Ashur commenting on my videos, so I'm like, you know, the fan, the fan inside me, I'm like, <laughs> what's happening? You know, like having those guys like being involved with what you're doing. And I feel like it, I don't want to attribute it completely to myself. Obviously, like a lot of people were doing it as well. But I feel like since it kind of started picking up, a lot of people started doing it. You know, I have a lot of guys constantly texting me like in social media saying like, oh, I really like that trick. Like, do you like this one? Or like they send me their own tricks or they post a trick and they tag me. Or like, that's cool. It's so cool. That's so it's really like, cool. it gives me like, an, like a different perspective on squash. That it's, it's not always about like winning and losing as much as I want. I love winning. I love competing. I love giving everything I have. But it also gives like another edge where I can breathe a little bit and be like, ah, this is nice. It's like a little like breather, you know? Yeah. And just seeing other people succeed at it just makes me happy because it's like we're creating something new. There's another guy, uh, Emir Evans, well, like fellow uh, yeah. tour professional. Yeah. Doing very similar, you know. He has his really fun tricks, a lot of talent, a lot of flair. Like, yeah, I have. Seen, I know what you're talking. About. Exactly, yeah, and yeah. he has some insanely cool videos that are also like promoting the game of squash. And like, yeah. our purpose like is ultimately growing the game we love. You know, we're not doing it for like just benefit ourselves. We want yeah. the game to grow. We want more people investing in the game, and if that happens, therefore we're gonna get more as well. You know, we're gonna right. get like more tournaments, the prize money is going to increase, it's going to be more sponsors, so it, it's beneficial for everyone in the game, you know? Yeah. So I think my purpose was together just enjoying my time on court that I've always done. <laughs> like I don't really enjoy doing going through the drills and just straight drives and all that stuff. Like I have to do it, but I don't enjoy it as much as doing this stuff, you know? Yeah. So it, it's always like a different aspect in squash that I love looking forward to when I'm a little like sick of the normal, um, right? Yeah. 99 in the world right now. We talked a little bit beforehand uh, as well about your goal for next season. By the end of next year, you want to be not necessarily in the top 50, but around that range because it's kind of difficult with injuries or with different results or with, you know, you, you never know who you're going to get in different draws. If you want to be around that range and you want to be qualifying for these platinum events, you want to play in the World Championships next year, you want to play in the British Open next year. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about, about your season this year. Some big results. Um, some unlucky circumstances that led to uh, not necessarily playing as many tournaments as you want or not necessarily qualifying or getting all the draws that you were hoping for. Um, how, did, how do you feel this season went for you on the Pro Tour and then what can everyone expect from you next year? All right, so I feel, I feel like this season, as cliche as it sounds, was a roller coaster for me. <laughs> you know, I know everyone says it, but yeah. I truly, truly mean it. Um, I started off with a bang. I started playing the squash of my life. I won three PSA tours uh, titles in a row. So I won 3K, 9K, 6K, back to back to back. I, w I felt unbeatable, you know? I was feeling insanely good. I was playing the squash I wanted. I was committed to it. I was so happy that I finally had the time to commit fully, you know? That I, I, don't, yeah. I didn't have any deadlines for this Sunday that I was worrying about or right. any exams next week. Right. I was just fully, my, my whole purpose in life was just getting better at squash. So I feel like that really helped me a lot. 
and everything was going well. I had a couple tournaments on my calendar. I was like, let's say 140, 130 in the world. And then I go to LA. I have a really good tournament. I play against like tremendously talented players. I had uh, I played Victor Birtus in second round. He was number three seed in the 15K. It was a super hard match. He's incredibly talented and I feel like we share a lot of our personality on court. Like a lot of like weird shots, different aspects of the game and I was able to, to sneak that win. And then when I got to semifinals, I was playing uh, Mohamed Sakaria. Oh yeah. Obviously, we all know how good he is. But I, I had struggled a lot. some strings maybe behind the scenes, try to get him to direct soul. <laughs> as, hard as, as hard as it sounds, I, we hope. We, hope is the last thing we lose. Yeah, it does. But then right... Never say never. Right, yeah, exactly. Right before that match, I was playing my, uh, my teammate, uh, Edgar Ramirez. I was uh, like also a fellow tour yeah. player from Colombia. A very personal match because we've grown up together, so it's always difficult to play the people you grew up with, you know, like, especially on tour. Yeah. And then had like half. So do you do you like that or do you th- that that's interrupt you? But do you en- enjoy like the that that moment of like, hey, look at us! Like we're playing in a professional tournament in a big time match, like, and we're both here in this moment. Obviously, I'm sure you're thinking, well, if I lose here, I hope he wins the finals. But but do you enjoy that moment of playing each other? Or is it more like ah, uh, like let's just get through this? I, I absolutely play. love it. Okay. I love it. Yeah. It's like, I mean, just just a quick, uh, just like experience I had playing uh, Pipe Herrera in Bermuda. Yeah. I'll get to it in a second because that's at the end of the season, but just remind me about that. Okay, we'll circle back <laughs> yeah. to Pipe, yeah. So I, I'm playing Edgar. I'm 2-1 up. I go to retrieve like the most normal shot ever, like just a straight drive in the backhand. And I hear my knee crack really hard again, which is what the same thing that happened three years before that in Drexel where I had my surgery. Same thing that happened. My leg got completely locked up. And it, it usually took like a couple seconds for it to pop back in. And then I, I just start freaking out. I'm like, no, and I hear it pop back in. And as soon as it pops back in, it's completely functional. But your head is not, <laughs> you right. know? So like eventually I realized that it was my meniscus was broken in many pieces. And when that happened, it's because a piece of the meniscus would go out of place and it would completely lock my leg. And then the piece would like go back in and on his spot. And then the leg was functional, you know? Yeah. But it hadn't happened in a long time since my last surgery. So obviously, head goes everywhere. I start freaking out. But then at the same time, I'm like, I really want to win this. I really want to get this opportunity to play in the semis. Adrenaline took me over and I ended up winning the match. And I come out of that match. I, I break down. I go to a court by myself. I just start crying. I'm like, why again? You know, like, I'm just starting my tour, my career. Like, I don't want to have another surgery. Like, And that's where it started to be just a mental battle, you know? Because I was like, okay, like I've played on this before, I wanna play this, I wanna just perform, you know? I wanna, I wanna play against uh, Mohammed and see how it goes, you know? And as hard as it plays, it is to play like a junior that's that good, you know? But I was like, I just wanna enjoy it and stuff. We played a very competitive first game, I think it was like 20 minutes or something. He took it 11-8, I think, but good squash, you know? Yeah. It felt really good. And I was like, okay, like this is awesome, like let's keep going. Yeah. I start second game, first couple points, knee again. Yeah. I go to retrieve, again, very easy, not very easy, but like a routine backhand straight drive. Right. My knee completely gives out. I have to overstep with my right, and I'm like, play a couple more points, and I just tell him, like, listen, man, like, as, as much as this sucks, like, I have, I have to withdraw. Like, my, my knee is, n- is not doing great. So it was brutal. I go back. I, I schedule a doctor's appointment, and this is where the season gets crazy because <laughs> I, I had that in the back of my mind I'm like okay I need to sort this out but we had national games and national games is like Olympics but within Colombia and you play states against states you know and it was the first time I was representing the state I represent now which is Antioquia which is a different city than the one I was born in okay so obviously they supported me for a long time for this event you're born, I, born I, in Bogota yeah. by the way okay and uh, they I had to show up you know like it's not yeah. I really had to be there. Yeah. Obviously, injuries and everything, but like the principle behind it is like they supported me for years. For this, I have to be there, you know? Yeah. So that was in the back of my head, and I had a couple tournaments scheduled in Europe. So everything was cruising. I scheduled my doctor's appointment two days before the national games. Um, well, the, the appointment was three days before. I was able to get an MRI last minute. Super lucky. The guy, like the doctor, reads the MRI for me, and he's like, listen, like, there's no way around this. Like, 
your meniscus is gone so <laughs> you have to get surgery and then obviously it was very hard for me I, I asked him like I know I shouldn't play but I have to show up for this like what can I do like you know and he was like I don't advise playing at all obviously he was a doctor <laughs> he's a doctor he's like I don't advise this at all if you have to play it's on you and you've played on it before but I wouldn't the PSAs scratch them like, there's no need there's gonna be more PSAs the national games as much as I don't advise it I see you're processing with like funding and all that stuff and even though I don't fund it he said it like nine times I don't like yeah like, don't yeah. think you should play I understand I understand where you're coming from right I went to national games I didn't play individuals I like they decided it was best to put me in both doubles and teams and both doubles were like back to back so I'd play like men's come out and then go back in for mixed Next. <laughs> yeah, it was, and who are your partners uh, in men's it was Juan Pablo Gomez he's an upcoming player as well okay. hasn't gone through the rankings just yet but he's also training really hard I'm sure he'll he'll make his move soon and Maria Clara Ramirez she's yeah, in, in, in Dartmouth yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I was at Denison for exactly. a and yeah. incredibly talented player yeah, as well like, she's so good so strong in, in, like, in her mind yeah. so it was it was an experience you know and then I started playing and you know when you get in that groove of like the adrenaline just takes over and you want to win and perform well for the people who supported you and we start going we have a good match against Ronald in doubles Ronald and Felipe Tovar another, another like really good local player we beat them with Juan Paulo tight match we go to semis we win semis we get to finals with Maria Clara we get to finals suddenly we're in two finals and then I had back to back finals against uh, Pipe Herrera and Juan Jose Torres you know how how good of the team that could yeah, be. <laughs> and, Vienna, exactly. and, uh, oh, wow. yeah. and then the other final was against Miguel and Catalina. Of course. So yeah, it, it was exactly. Brutal, wow. So we go out, play the first final, we lose it against Pipe and Juan Jose, which I can't say it wasn't expected because they were favorites, but we thought we had a, a good chance, you know? It was very tight. We weren't able to convert when we needed to. And then I was feeling really bad. I really wanted the win. I come out of court and just go, like, refresh my mind and go back on court straight away with Maria Clara. And that's probably top three craziest matches of my life against Miguel and Catalina. <laughs> this like, is softball doubles, by Softball doubles, Because yeah. he, here it's like you, you, we, we play with the hardball. No, no, no. So, so softball North doubles, American. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, we lose so the first So what's the game. strategy, by the way, for softball doubles out of curiosity? Like, it's kind of, like, what's it's completely like case-to-case case basis, like? depending on who's playing against you, if it's mixed or men's. But it's all about, like, moving the ball around the court rather than hitting yeah. winners like a lot of people think because it's a 13 inch 10 a lot of people think that it's just shooting and shooting but the ball is so hot that it's very unlikely to hit an outright winner so it's more about positioning and trying to catch people off guard to hit the ball like to their bodies interesting okay. so we played the match we were 1-0 down like 11-9 first game and then second game it was 10 uh, all at sudden death sudden death right. exactly and then Catalina hits one to the middle, and I don't know what took over me, but I literally just went, like, forehand slap into the neck and roll it. We win 11-10. And I start just freaking out, like, let's go, let's go. We go out, obviously come back in. And we're 7-2 down in the third, and stuff just starts moving for some reason. I hit a winner here, Maria hits a winner there, I hit a winner here, we level it up, it's 9-7, 9-8, 9-0. And suddenly, like, we realize, like, we just came back. Right These there. guys have to be shaking, you know, yeah. like, 9 all. And then Maria does something that was, like, absurd. Because she was, like, rallying with Catalina. And then Miguel intervened in one shot. Maria was so far from that shot. And she dove. I've, I had never seen her dive in my life. She <laughs> dove, recovered the shot, and dodged the next shot so I could retrieve it. And we ended up winning, like, just taking a let in that point, which was amazing just because of the fact that like, we shouldn't have retrieved that ball. Wow. We end up winning the next point, and the last point, like Miguel dives, Catalina, they switch sides, like, it's just all over the court. And then at some point, Maria hits a perfect drop. Miguel dives again, he dove twice. Dives again, and I was gonna try hit him, but he hit like a decent shot, so it was hard. And then I just played the tiniest drop I could, Catalina got together, and I just smacked it right at Catalina. And as soon as I smacked her, I just like jumped, like climbed the wall. Like it was insane because wow. we were like we became like national champions. So after the biggest low of my career in of my season, it came like the biggest high with that win, you know. Yeah. And then after that, 
a little breakdown. I was like, all right, out of squash for a bit, got my surgery, and then he was fine. You know, came back into playing, played, wow. played. That's a, really no. Wow. I, that's what that's what I meant. It's cliche, but it was literally a roller yeah. coaster. Then I had my surgery, and I ended up coming back. I played well, whatever, and then I was scheduled for a couple tournaments that I was really looking forward to. Uh, the World Championships qualifier and the Bermuda Open. And then shortly before the qualifier that I was looking forward to, yeah. um, one of my best friends at school passed away. And yeah. it was, yeah. yeah, like rest in peace for him now. I know he's in my heart. <laughs> but at the time it was, it was brutal, man. Like obviously the head just wouldn't stop. I was supposed to play that event two days after it happened. I went because I know he would have freaked out at me if I didn't play it. <laughs> so I went just because I was hearing him like, don't, don't be stupid, you know, like, yeah. dear thing. And I went there and I, I, I didn't have any purpose, man. Like, I, I, weren't, I wanted to be anywhere else in life right. but on court. So back to the low. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for your loss. It's, it's yeah, like, I mean, we, we're coping with it now and it's fine. And we know, again, everything happens for a reason. Right. <laughs> always believe and that it. That could have been on, if you were really on, that could have been winnable for you. Spencer ended up winning, winning that. Um, but you, you could have definitely made a run. And, and no, draw, I think just like I think I think, yeah, I think I had a I think I had a really good chance. Yeah. Uh, I had beaten Sebastian before. I had beaten uh, Enriquez before. Yeah. So I had beat a bunch of the guys on the draw before, and I, I thought I had a good run. But at the time, I just lost purpose a lot. You know, I, it's the first time in my entire life that I've been in a tournament without wanting to play it, and I lost that fanboy I had in me in squash. I, I hated my time on court. I cried in between games. Kareem was there actually, and Kareem helped me out and was coaching me. And he was pretty much just listening to me. I was like, dude, like, I don't know what to do. I would like freak out. I started crying in between points. I couldn't focus on hitting a ball. I was literally just crying. And then I lost in five, which was insane because I would go like this, you know? <laughs> and I, I didn't even play bad. It was just, and I wasn't pissed. I, I just didn't want to be there, you know? Right. And then after that, I got like really scared because I was like, damn, like, there's no way I lost my love for squash, you know? This had never happened to me before, that I didn't want to be on court. Not one time that I was in a tournament saying, I don't want to be here. Wow. And that was the first ever time. And then I had Bermuda the week after. Obviously, I went to Philadelphia. I spent a lot of time with my friends. We all, like, gathered and went through it together. And then in Bermuda, I was really scared because I'm like, damn, like, I, I want to play, but I'm, I'm scared it's going to feel the same, you know? I, I don't yeah. want this to become a thing and have the thought that he passed away become a thing within my game as well right. and not be able to enjoy it yeah. so I, Bermuda was amazing <laughs> like I ended up I rented a scooter biked around the island went cliff jumping went I just enjoyed my life in, on tour and was like I'm gonna go through this event as as happily as I can you know and I ended up playing great and that's where I played Pipe so it, it all comes down to, <laughs> to, to this moment yeah because I was playing Pipe and him and I, another friend, yeah, another sure. friend from Colombia as well, fellow teammate. We started playing, and the first rally was like three and a half minutes, <laughs> or like second rally was three and a half minutes. It was absurd. Like people like clapped for a long time after the second rally, and both of us were like, just looked at us like, is, is this how it's gonna be? Like, <laughs> and then we start playing. Like my matches before that were okay. I played good, but I wasn't like, you know, with that love that, I, that characterizes me on yeah. the squash court. And against Pipe, I just started playing the call, like the court was really hot, the ball was bouncing like crazy, but we start going, I win the first one, I win the second one, then he wins the third, he wins the fourth, and then I remember there was a moment, it was uh, like 5-4 or 5 all in the fifth, crazy rally, and he looks at me, and he's like, we're dying here, like he said that in Spanish, like we're going till death here. He didn't say, I'm going to beat you, he didn't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this, no, he was like, we're going till death here. That's badass. Yeah. Bro. And then, line. dude, that, that moment just brought so much joy to me because, like, it reminded me of, of the beauty of competing, right? Like, yeah. you always want to win. You never want to lose. But both of them shape you. And that moment was just, like, everything that squash means for me. Yeah. You just, like, the, the healthy competition of, like, wanting to beat your brother, but also wanting to see them do well. Yeah. And from there, we just started going and going and going. We had, there's a video of the last point. I've, I don't think I've ever dove in my life as well. Like, I'm, I'm too long to dive. The last, point, the last um, point, there's a video of me diving into the front of the court, picking up the ball, then him like jumping onto it, and then I slip on my own, <laughs> on my own sweat, and I just take every desperate measure to get the ball, and I can't. 
I, both my legs cramp, he throws his racket, he's like, let's go like that. And I see that video and it's just pure joy, man. And it, I, I, like, even if I lost, I was like, this is what squash is about. Yeah. And since that moment, wow. I've been able to enjoy it. Like, And Joe Reha is a great quote, the Tufts coach, about he wants guys, what he's looking for in recruits, that not necessarily, you know, obviously you need good players, you need talent, but the number one thing he says, he loves players that look at a fifth game when they have nothing left in the tank and that that's their favorite part about playing squash is when they go out there for that fifth game and they have nothing left in the tank and they love that feeling of going out there and fighting and pushing the limits and that's what that's what it's all about is controlling what you can control giving your all and like Reminds me of like Israel Adesanya and UFC. I don't know if you've yeah, seen that of course. clip. But so, yeah, that's that's great. That's yeah, no, it was awesome. And then after that moment, I was able to completely get it back. And, you know, enjoy it and find purpose and reason behind it. And since then, it's been it's been great. Just yeah. played a couple of tournaments. Now I'm at nine tournaments, so I still have a couple more to go to finish my ranking. But I'm very excited for what's coming. Yeah. That sounds like a big life year for you too. Not even just squash year. It sounds yeah. like a, like what's what's the biggest thing you've learned? through squash, because I know for me, I mean, you know, playing college squash this year, it was a huge, hugely formative experience for me off the court. I learned so much from, you know, such a valuable experience for me. What, what's the, what are the one or two biggest things that playing squash and traveling the world and going through all these ups and downs on court taught you about life off the court? I feel like this one was a big one, you know, like finding purpose behind it. It's like, I do this because I love it, you know? And if I do it, if I do what I love, I'm gonna love life, you know? And that was a big reassurance that I'm in the right path doing what I love, which is playing squash, you know? It was very scary thoughts with like my uh, good friend passing away, all that stuff, but again, like all of that just brought too many thoughts that I couldn't process. And the life lesson between that was like, whatever happens, like, you still, like, you're still gonna do what you love, you know? Like, that life doesn't stop. And right. at some point, we're all going to pass away, you know? That was a, another big lesson, because yeah. as dumb as it seems, like, people don't really process it. Yeah. And having him pass away, it was like, we have to love what we do until we go with him, you know? It's like, there's no, there's no time to be sad about something, you know? Like, always right. find the bright things in life, because, like, your time here is limited, right? And it's way deeper than just a random squash lesson, but... <laughs> But I feel like all the circumstances taught that, I and mean, then again, it brought that like deep love that characterizes me in the squash court back that's to amazing. me. Yeah. After, so I think that would be the, the awesome. biggest one, of course. Well, that's really awesome to hear, MTS. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it sounds like it's been a roller coaster of a year for me, watching from afar. I've become a big fan of yours, so it's been uh, it's been great to kind of watch you from a distance and now up close these past couple of months with the NSL. And now we're here. We're in New York City. Open Squash has been uh, generous enough to uh, host us. The first ever NSL match, in addition to it being the last regular season match, first ever NSL match that will take place on a glass court. So, really, all eyes are on the Big Apple. Tomorrow night, 6 p.m., as your New York City Knights take on the Newport Dragons. What is the game plan heading into tomorrow? What can the fans expect from the match? It's going to be you, Sebastian, Rory, right, versus Ramit, Spencer, and TJ Dominski. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't really come up with a game plan just yet. I feel like, I mean, we, have, we still haven't even gathered a team. Yeah. But we all know what we have to do, right? Like, we know our strengths, we know our weaknesses. Like, we, like what you said, like, we have a very, very clear team in that sense. Because our strengths are very clear. And our weaknesses are very clear. So we know what we have in order to work against something at any given point. You know? You need to burn some time, we have people that can burn time. We need some nicks, we have people that can hit some nicks. You want both, we have both. You know, so it's like, I feel like more than a game plan before the match is more adapting through the match, which is the biggest factor of the NSL, especially right now that everyone's figuring it out, right? Yeah. Like there's no good coaches or bad coaches, there's no good strategy or bad strategy, because everyone's figuring it out. So I feel like it's more feeling it in the moment and see what can work best at the time and go from there, you know? Just experimenting. But for people, like, what they can expect, it, like, it's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be so much fun. Like, there's so much to play for while still enjoying it so much. Like, this venue is amazing. The people that are coming, like, all the players are amazing. I'm, I'm friends with all of them, from my team and the other team. Yeah. So it's, it's a spectacle, cool, you know? And I feel like a lot of people can expect exactly that. Just a, a good time on the squash court. 
and just a really competitive match that means a lot for both teams yeah. while just enjoying it, you know? Yeah. Well, man of the match against the Chicago Grizzlies. Perhaps he'll rack up another one of those tomorrow night against the Newport Dragons, 6 o'clock on the NSL YouTube channel. And maybe he's working towards, in addition to a potential NSL championship, an NSL MVP award as well. So oh, yeah. we'll keep our uh, eyes on that. Matias, thank you very much for doing that. Thank us. you very I much. I really appreciate it. No matter how hard you try.